She took the world by storm at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, scoring the first ever perfect 10 in gymnastics, a feat she would duplicate six times before the games came to a close. With her coach, Bella Caroli, at her side, she continued to shine all the way through the 1980 Moscow Olympics, where she won three more medals for her native Romania. But her life started to change following Caroli's defection in 1981, and eventually she did the same, defecting in 1989. Today she's married to fellow Olympic gymnast Bart Connor and works tirelessly on behalf of such causes as the Muscular Dystrophy Association, International Special Olympics, and the Nadia Komenich Children's Clinic in Bucharest. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with five-time Olympic gold medalist, gymnastic superstar, Nadia Komenich. this is how your life would be at this point? Of course not. Uh, I uh, started gymnastics when I was six and a half and I um, had a lot of energy like many other kids at that particular age and uh, my mom decided there was a good place for me to play uh, in a gym. Uh, I uh, used to destroy uh, all the furniture in the house <laughs> And uh, she just wanted to occupy my energy with something. So I was lucky that uh, in a place where I was born, uh, it was a gymnastic school. And I started uh, to go there um, once a week. And I loved it because I could do things that I couldn't do at home. And uh, just for the love of it, I had no idea that this is going to take me to the accomplishments that I had uh, at the Olympic Games in 76 and of course in 1980 and everything else that happened after that. Um, I like to be surprised with a life like that because it's better not to think where you're going to be in 20 years from now, just to have uh, little goals every day and uh, the big one is going to come later. Is it a natural talent or is it something you learn to do? I think it doesn't hurt to have some talent. Uh, Probably I would have been pretty good in any other sports. I was just lucky to have a gymnastics school next to the place where I was born. But I, I, I was a kid that um, I was very competitive since I was five. Uh, I, uh, I know that uh, at five years old I uh, competed in a kindergarten in a tricycle competition and I won that too. So, <laughs> so you're always a winner. I, not always a winner, but I like to, to be the best in whatever I do. The story I heard is that Bella came to your school, your elementary school, and saw you and a friend running around and playing and being physical in some way and knew at that moment those were a couple of kids he wanted to get in his school and that he searched the school over to find you guys because you had disappeared again. True? I'm not sure exactly what's the true story because <laughs> Bella remembers one way and I remember another way but and people tells me another way. I, I was doing some kind of gymnastics by the time when Bella came to the kindergarten. So I think a friend of mine uh, that there was also playing uh, with me in a gym uh, was at the kindergarten on that day when Bella came. And I think that he asked us uh, who, who loves gymnastics or who can do some kind of gymnastic tricks. And we've done some cartwheels and other things that we've learned. So uh, that's when I believe that we got to uh, get to be coached by, by Bella later and his wife. Actually, I started with his wife before I started with Bella, and I had two, three other coaches before uh, Bella uh, took the group, uh, and uh, we, we were a team at the, in the place where I, where I was born. I heard you say in an interview before that the secret weapon was that you guys trained for so many hours every day, that the other teams would train for four, but you guys would train for six or eight hours. Is that true? I think so, but I don't think that only Romanians, only us, we train that huge amount of hours. Um, I, I've heard that also the former Soviet Union used to train the same amount, and uh, also China, I believe, they did train the same amount. So. Uh, after everybody found out that the big secret is a longer amount of hours to train, they started to do that, and they became better. 
Did you ever feel like it was stealing you of your childhood? Did you ever feel like you were putting so much time into there, you didn't have time to be a little girl? I, I wanted to spend time in the gym because that was my... Uh, I, w I was happy there. I had friends, and I, everything I was doing was with 20 other girls. Uh, I, I stay away uh, sometime occasionally from the gym, and I didn't like it. Uh, I just had more fun there. I think uh, uh, every time when I was coming home, I was talking to my parents only about what I've done in the gym, and I can't wait to go the next day. Yeah. What do you learn from those experiences about accomplishing dreams? Was there a goal that you had set for yourself, or was it just doing what you were doing? I think there were little goals that you, I mean, especially in gymnastics, just to, to be better the next day. And, uh, uh, you know, I used to write on my notebook about things that I've done today and what I can do better. So I've read that all the time the next day, and I was trying to be better today than yesterday. And uh, I think that's the best way to go through life. Now, you got the first perfect 10 received in gymnastics in the Olympics. When you get that, do you realize that it's significant at the moment? And if you do realize it, does it help you lose focus? All of a sudden now, are you thinking about something you shouldn't be thinking about? At 14, when I got the first 10, which was actually a 1.00 because the, um, the scoreboard was not prepared to uh, show a 10, uh, I remember that Longines was the company that created the scoreboard. And they actually called the uh, president of the Gymnastic Federation to ask them if somebody will score a 10 in, the, in gymnastics. And uh, they said nobody will score a 10. So when they <laughs> heard nobody will score a 10, they just didn't put enough lights in space before the decimal. And when the 10 was supposed to come up, it was a 1.00 because there was no space to make a 1.0.00. Right. And I was 14, and uh, I didn't know what there was. At the beginning, I looked at the scoreboard, and uh, one didn't look like a very good score to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked, I looked around to some of my teammates, and one of them made me a sign that's a 10, but they, don't, they cannot show it. I don't think you realize the, um, what happened at the time when you were 14. Yeah. You know, I know the 10 is the best highest score that you, you can ever get, but I didn't know that I'm going to make history with that, and that's going to actually change my life, and uh, I was just went on to compete to the next event, which was BEAM, and I got another 10, and then some other 10s <laughs> the next days, and I ended up with 7, and I thought the judges were too nice to me. Really? Yeah. When you look back at those routines, because they're all, they exist on tape, do you think they were worthy of 10s? When I look back at those routines, I think I've done better than that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, because I, uh, you do the same thing many times in a training, and somehow it feels, even if it's the same thing, it feels different every time you do it. But um, I think that the girl that was before me, was she got a 9.95, and I was much better than her. There was no place to go. Right. So if there would have been a you know, up to 11, I would have got probably a 10 point something, but the 10 was the highest score, and uh, they gave it to me. When you get a high score like that, and then you go back home, and you're training now again for whatever's next, is there a point that says, why do I need to keep training? I've already gone as far as I can go. I've got the perfect score in the Olympics. What's left? No, because I, th I, I wanted to go uh, more and uh, it's, uh, it's actually harder to, to keep yourself on that position that, than going to that position. You know, I, uh, nobody knew me when I was competing in 76 and I got the 10. And then after that, everybody wanted to know about me, where I'm coming from, and what's my secret, why am I so much better than everybody else. <laughs> so there was a huge curiosity, and I was still young. I still wanted to do gymnastics. I, I was planning to retire in my 20s. So I was 15. I thought I can do another Olympic cycle, which I went for it. Yeah. How much did your life change after this? When you went back home, was life different? Not to me, no, because I went back and I had three days of celebrations with everybody else. And then we went back to the gym. Did we you had... have any idea about the craziness in the rest of the world about it? I you? heard about it uh, because <laughs> I came to uh, perform at the Medicine Square Garden in a lot of other places, and there were just... It was a huge uh, uh, amount of people that they wanted to just touch me and touch my ponytail and everything <laughs> else. And they were 
you know, yelling. I haven't seen anything like that but on TV, so uh, it was the Nadia mania, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yes it was. When you went back home then, and then life is continuing on, now that you've been out and you've seen the world around you outside of Romania, did that make life in Romania different for you? No, because I, 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 was, I grew up in that kind of life, and I uh, grew up with my family and with my friends. It was always nice to go and travel to see what else is every, everywhere else, because through gymnastics I had opportunities that I probably wouldn't have uh, if I was just not doing any sports. And, uh, you know, you're 12, 13, 14 when you start to travel and uh, to places that you don't think that the parents can afford to take you. And through the sport I was able to, you know, visit all the places. Yeah. And uh, I love to travel a lot, but I always like to come back home. Yeah. In then, of course, the 80 Olympics. And then if, if I've got the timing right, in 81, you're touring with Bella and his wife, and they defect while you're on tour. And then you go back home. Now how's life changed? Well, I uh, was very um, um, sad when they left because uh, I was, I was uh, finished with my career anyway. Uh, but I was worried about what's going to happen with the other girls, who's going to coach them because they were in charge at that particular time. So, but there were some other coaches that started to do that, which through the years they became really famous. Yeah. Uh, Bellu and Bitang, they did many uh, Olympic, they created many Olympic champions in Romania. Uh, I went on with my life because I already retired at that point. I just competed in 81 at the University Games, which was a competition in Bucharest. And then I retired, and I went to do a university. I went to the university. I finished the university for four years, and I was just working as a judge and coach in the same field. As I understood it, though, in your biography, I think you made reference to the fact that life became bleaker, that they limited What's your bleaker? <laughs> darker. It wasn't as joyful. That they limited your travel, and the government kind of stepped in and kept closer tabs. Um, I was okay for a while, and then uh, I I was. Yeah, I, I actually the the I left Romania because I was prohibited to make any traveling anymore uh, of any kind, and uh, the fact that I was followed by the police every step, so that was the reason that I left. Does it disillusion you though? Because here you had represented this country, you were the world spokesperson in a lot of ways for your country, and now in a sense they're on top of you. They're watching your every move. Did that make you feel? Uh, unloved by your own country, untrusted? No, I don't or... think so, no. Um, I think that there was uh, probably a, a part of the, the system, and not only me, but a lot of other people that were famous probably went through the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but you just deal with that. Uh, you, you try to make it better for you, or you just take it the way it is. You decided to leave that? Yeah, I left. How was that experience? It was you? difficult. Uh, it was difficult because I uh, I had to leave my family behind, which was the most important thing in my life. And um, I knew that at that point when I left that I, I would never see them again because the, Romania was still a communist country. But fortunately, uh, there was a revolution happened there, and uh, I was in the States when I found out about that. And uh, I got in touch with my family not very soon, but soon enough to find out that everybody was fine. Were you surprised when you came to this country, or actually to Canada, when you left your home to see your fame was still here, that yes. people knew who you were and that you were somebody? <laughs> I was very surprised because we tend to forget what happened last year and uh, the fact that people remember my successes, not only my successes uh, that happened 30-something years ago, uh, uh, but they remember exactly where they were and who, with who they were when I scored the 10, which is hard to believe. Yeah. I, I think in today's world you have to make, create something that's huge for the people to remember particular moments in history or in life that happened. So I was happy that I was one of them. Yeah. Was it hard to be thrust into the public eye, though? I was not used to, I, uh, to that kind of attention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was new to me, and uh, I had to learn. Uh, I had uh, good people around, like my husband and his manager, Paul Zert, that helped me uh, learn everything. Plus, you have to put on the top the language. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah. it's not the same. I mean, I've learned English and French in school, but not enough to survive. <laughs> yeah. And then not only did you come here and have your own successes and all of that, you want to give back. And you've worked very hard at making sure that you are in touch with a lot of different organizations from the Children's Center that you're building and the Special Olympics and all of that. What drives you to do all of that? I've learned when I came to the States that uh, one important thing is to be a volunteer, which I was not familiar with that, even though I was helping uh, people uh, personally uh, uh, before. I learned many things, and uh, I, uh, I found out about the Special Olympics. I found out, uh, found out about the, the Dis Muscular Dystrophy Association, those two things that I've been involved for many years. And, of course, uh, the most important thing is to be able to go back and help uh, my Romanian family, not p personal family, but the kids. And uh, I'm building a hospital uh, for um, underserved kids in Romania, which is called the Nadia Comunic Clinic. And I really like to do that because I, I can, and I think um, as I was helped when I was a child to, be, to do something in my life, I think that we, we don't have to do it. We have the obligation to do that, uh, yeah. athletes. So it's something that I've learned, and I love it. And uh, I like to travel around doing a lot of charity work, but also doing some other work that uh, I'm actually doing today. What have you learned about discipline from being an athlete? What has that taught you in different parts of your life? Discipline I've learned from my family, first of all, uh, because my family was very uh, dedicated and to their work, and I've learned from my father that the only way you achieve in life is if you put some extra amount of hours of work, which I've done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've always uh, done more than people ask me to do. And um, uh, in everything that I do today that doesn't have to do anything related to sports, uh, I, I go to the basics that I've learned when I was an athlete. You organize your time, you dedicate your time, you find motivation, and all the other things. And uh, I, I apply them today, and that's why I think that I'm able to uh, be in three places in six days. <laughs> <laughs> do you get tired? And if you do, what is a lazy day for you? Lazy day? <laughs> I, um, I, I try to, in whatever I do and the travelings that I do, I try to come back uh, to my base to recharge the batteries, which is home, which is Oklahoma. And, of course, now it's a little harder to travel for me, because um, I have a two-year-old, uh, and uh, he kind of, he now, he figures out when he sees uh, suitcases. Uh, he knows what's he going He knows on. that somebody <laughs> is going, and uh, he knows that I'm going in a plane, and I'm going to bring him a present. So, <laughs> so that's why he sign. let me go. <laughs> <laughs> but are there days when you just, you sit around the house, watch TV, just have a lazy day? Or are you so organized and structured that you make sure you make every moment count? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty more, uh, even a lazy day is not a lazy day for me. I mean, what's a lazy day? Uh, mm. No, I like to, do, I will have many lazy days later in my life. I guess I have time <laughs> for that. <laughs> so you get those later But now on. I like to travel and uh, I like to be together with a lot of um, Olympic, former Olympic legends that I do a lot of work with, which is Mark Spitz, and we travel together. And I love to be with Mark because he's, such a interesting um, personage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we travel together and uh, we uh, do this uh, white, uh, uh, this uh, your best, um, your personal best campaign, and I think it's a great motivation for us to talk about um, your lifestyle. It's never too late to do something for you, and of course, my uh, personal introduction of uh, the way of uh, using Botox, which is a uh, very important to me at this particular age. <laughs> okay, there are lots of people out there that use Botox. Yes. Very few will admit to it. Why do you? I think that many years ago people wouldn't talk about it, but now it's just a part of your lifestyle. And uh, I, um, I have a great friend who does my eyebrows, Anastasia. She does the eyebrows to all of the celebrities in Los Angeles. She's Romanian. 
And she used <laughs> to be a gymnast. And then she introduced me to the Botox because she said, I can fix your eyebrows, but what are you going to do about your 11s? And I'm like, what's an 11? This was about six years ago. So she said, uh, you know, when you turn a particular age, you go in one direction, and there are many ways that you can fix some things, little things, which become very important to your lifestyle. So how important is the physical, especially with someone who does the work on so many causes, and I hate to say important causes, but when you stack these things up, physical appearance compared to working with Special Olympics and all of that, how do you see them meld together? Oh, I think that the, the, it's very important because people have this image of athletes of like being ageless and like being, I'm, in my case, being 14. And I don't want to be 14 minds. anymore. <laughs> I mean, I'm 46 and I, I like my life at 46. Uh, I think that I, uh, I was fortunate to, uh, to take care of me because I've learned a lot through sports. And uh, I have a lot of information. I have, I have friends who give me information. And I think this is the important uh, aspect of life. Have a lot of information out there and try to, to see what works for you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Bart, your husband, Connor. How did you two meet? We've met in 1976 in Madison Square Garden. We did compete in the same competition called the American Cup. And uh, it, seemed it was his birthday. It was March 28th, and we both won uh, the competition. And uh, with the trophies in our hands, uh, somebody from the newspaper told Bart, why don't you lean over and give her a kiss on the cheek? And there was a nice photo that came on the uh, <laughs> New York Times in sport, on, in sport page. And uh, there was a great moment for Bart, he says. It was a great moment <laughs> for me, too, but I didn't remember <laughs> Many years later that we met in, uh, in Madison Square Garden. And when I came to U.S., uh, I did a television show, and uh, the host asked us when we first met. And in the same time, he said 76, and I said 81. <laughs> so he looked at me, and he said, Don't you remember the American Cup, Madison Square Garden, kiss on a chick? And I looked at him, and I said, mm, I don't remember. <laughs> then I was like, hmm. Maybe I remember it was, it was a little blonde guy. <laughs> and that was the little blonde guy. But the entire team was a bunch of little blonde guys. Oh. So. <laughs> so you didn't know which one? Huh? No. So how did the two of you know then that there was a connection? Oh, we didn't know at that time. I was 14, and I was not interested in boys. Um, in, uh, w we were still seeing each other in, uh, in exhibitions that I've done through the years. I came here in 81 when we did Nadia tour. We did 11 cities. So Bart was a part of the tour. So uh, I think we knew each other. We were friends, but gymnastic friends. And then when I left Romania and I live in Canada, because I lived in Montreal for a year and a half, we got connected because we did uh, a television show, The Mystery and Magic of Nadia, I started to do some gymnastic exhibition for a couple of years after that. So we start to become better friends. And so it took us about four or five years to, you know, there was a little, yeah. a little, a little, a little. And then we started to date. So then we got married. So and now you have a baby. That's it. We have a baby. What's it like having your own theme? <laughs> <laughs> There's Nadia's theme. I know. That's, that's very interesting. I met the guy who wrote that, uh, Barry the Vorzan. Uh, the, um, he wrote that long time ago, long time before the Olympics in '76. Uh, the the piece was uh, called uh, "Bless the Beast and the Children." And um, after the Olympics, there was a television crew that came to Romania, and they wanted to do like a profile on me. And they did some nice photo shots in black and white, and an hour uh, of TV and. Uh, they put it together, and they were looking for some kind of music to cover up these slow motion tricks that I was doing. And they picked this thing, which was the name uh, Bless the Kids and the uh, Beast and the Children. And uh, after that piece, when it was on TV, the, the piece became, they sold, you know, like gold and platinum. And I ended up in Romania with the, with the gold CD. <laughs> with Nadia's theme on it, I'm, and I was like, mm, I, I know that people get this in, in their singing career. 
<laughs> and I didn't know what Gymnastics. it was. <laughs> so I kept it there. I had no idea. And when I came to the States, I found out because I, uh, and I started to watch it, a soap opera show, which is called uh, Young and the, the Restless, Restless yeah. because it had the Nadia team. And then I became very good friend with um, the, the, the guy who plays Victor Newman. <laughs> <laughs> and he came to Romania last month. <laughs> so it's, it's complicated and nice complicating. <laughs> when you look back on this life, even to this point, and you've got so many more years ahead of you, but do you think, wow, what a wild adventure this has been? Or do you think, oh my, how did I live all of this? <laughs> uh, no, it's been an adventure and it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> what are the goals you still have for yourself? I have little goals. The, the most important thing right now is my family and my little baby. And uh, to try to get as much as I can uh, back to Romania because I have family there. And also do the work that I do, traveling and do all the promotions and campaign because I like it. Yeah. I don't want to sit yet. Yet, <laughs> but there'll be a time down the road when you will get be, to finally. But it's gonna come for everybody, that time comes. Ever have the urge to get up on the balance beams or any of that anymore? The Whatever is very close to the floor, to the ground, I get. <laughs> you can still do <laughs> because that. Because it's safer. <laughs> <laughs> Nadia, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with You're us. Welcome. Truly a pleasure. Thank you. Nadia Komenich. To order a DVD of this or any episode of Interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.